Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Vera Bradley First Quarter Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Following the presentation, we'll conduct a question and answer session. Instructions will be provided at that time for you to queue up for questions. As a reminder, today's conference call is being recorded. I would now like to turn the call over to Mark D. Lai, Vera Bradley's Chief Administrative Officer. Please go ahead. Good morning and welcome, everyone. We'd like to thank you for joining us for today's call. Some of the statements made during our prepared remarks and in response to your questions may constitute forward-looking statements made pursuant to and within the meaning of the safe harbor provisions of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995 as amended. Such forward-looking statements are subject to both known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from those that we expect. Please refer to today's press release in the company's most recent Form 10-K filed with the SEC for a discussion of known risks and uncertainties. Investors should not assume that the statements made during the call will remain operative at a later time. We undertake no obligation to update any information discussed on today's call. I will now turn the call over to Vera Bradley CEO, Rob Wallstrom. Rob? Thank you, Mark. Good morning, and thank you for joining us on today's call. John Enright, our CFO, also joins me today. While total company first quarter revenues of $98.5 million fell below our expectations and resulted in a net loss before certain charges of $0.19 cents per diluted share, we continued implementation of our price increases, which helped offset logistics and sourcing pressures, continued to drive product innovation, controlled expenses, and completed $10.5 million of share repurchases, while maintaining a strong debt-free balance sheet. We are clearly seeing a bifurcation in the spending of our customer base. At Vera Bradley, direct channel full-line revenues were above last year as customers with higher household incomes remained engaged and spent more than last year. We also saw a healthy year-over-year -year rebound in indirect channel revenues. However, inflationary pressures, including, rate, including rising gas prices, particularly impacted the spending of Vera Bradley customers with household incomes below 55000 as well as traffic and spending in our Vera Bradley direct channel factory stores for the quarter. In addition, Pura Vita's e-commerce revenues continue to be significantly affected by the shift in social and digital media effectiveness and rising digital media costs. For the balance of the year, we are taking decisive actions to strengthen the enterprise and remain highly focused on our two core brands. On a company-wide basis, we are in the midst of a comprehensive cost reduction and efficiency process. We expect we will complete the identification of cost reductions and continue implementation in the second quarter, and we anticipate we will realize annual, annualized savings in the range of 15 to $25 million. We are also continuing to evaluate and execute strategic price increases for both brands to offset rising raw material and freight costs as appropriate. As you might recall, we began taking some price increases in the fourth quarter of last year. At the Vera Bradley brand, we remain confident in our core strategy. The brand is fundamentally strong, although we have been fighting through macro issues, including rapidly increasing supply chain costs, recessionary spending from lower household income customers, skyrocketing gas prices, and exponential increases in digital marketing costs. We are continuing to innovate and build on our lifestyle merchandising strategy with a laser focus on protecting the core, amplified by targeted marketing. We are maximizing the travel category, which is nearly back to pre-pandemic levels and optimizing our very important upcoming back to campus season with strategic product, product assortment enhancements. Of course, we are continuing with successful product collaborations like Disney, and just the second quarter, we have introduced partnerships with iconic names like Star Wars, Coleman and & Target, and Tupperware. We are thrilled about expanding our home assortments and adding cloud slip-ons and mules to our Bear Bradley footwear franchise this fall and holiday season. At Pura Vita, we are evolving our business model from one largely dependent on e-commerce and digital marketing to one that is a true omnichannel business with a more diversified marketing base. This will take time, but we are taking the actions to make this transformation happen and return the brand to growth. Chief Growth Officer Lockie Andrews has joined Pure Vita. She will work with the team with a primary focus on building a more innovative, effective, and performance-based marketing program by bolstering our internal marketing and data analytics talent and platform. 
Locky is a great addition to Pure Vita and to our entire organization. Her perspective, expertise, and creative thinking will be instrumental in developing Pure Vita's full potential as a unique lifestyle brand. In this newly created role, she has responsibility for all digital performance marketing, direct consumer sales, and merchandising initiatives across Pure Vita's channels and distribution. Working with co-founders Griffin Thal and Paul Goodman, she will not only strengthen the marketing initiatives, but she will explore, develop, and launch new sales channels and drive category growth and expansion over time. She has a deep background in retail, marketing, digital strategy, technology, and data analytics, and most recently held key e-commerce and digital post at Party City in Untucket, as well as running a boutique consulting firm for the past 15 years. We are very excited about opening three additional Pure Vita retail store locations this year, building on the success of our first store opening in San Diego last summer. The San Diego store continues to exceed our expectations, and we continue to experience a double-digit differential in our San Diego e-commerce business relative to the rest of the country since the store opened. Demonstrating the power of a retail presence has in driving digital sales, omni-channel loyalty, and spending. So we are very excited about additional store growth. We will open Pure Vita stores in Irvine Spectrum in Orange County, California, and in the high tourist area of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina in July, and in Phoenix and in the Phoenix market in September. We look forward to even more store growth in the future. Pure Vita's future growth will be a balance of online growth and growth in physical distribution channels. Stores will play a key role in driving new customer acquisition as we continue to diversify our marketing platforms. We will also continue to build Pure Vita customer excitement and engagement through collaborations like Disney, Hello Kitty, and the World Surfing League, partnering with key influencers and offering theme collections centered around key events like upcoming Shark Week. Now let me turn the call over to John to review the financial results. John? Thanks, Rob, and good morning. Let me go over a few highlights for the first quarter. The numbers I will discuss today are all non-GAAP. For a complete detail of items excluded from the non-GAAP numbers, as well as a reconciliation of GAAP to non-GAAP numbers, please reference today's press release. Consolidated net revenues totaled 98.5 million compared to 109.1 million in the prior year first quarter. The consolidated net loss totaled 6.1 million or 19 cents per diluted share compared to a loss of $1.7 million, or $0.05 cents per diluted share in the prior year. Vera Bradley direct segment revenues totaled $61.6 million, a 7.6% decrease from $66.7 million last year. Comparable sales declined 11.1% in the first quarter. Vera Bradley indirect segment revenues totaled $17 million, or 11.2% increase over $15.3 million in the prior year first quarter. Pure Vita segment revenues totaled $19.8 million, a 26.8% decrease from $27.1 million last year. First quarter consolidated gross profit totaled $52.5 million, or 53.3% of net revenues, compared to $59.2 million, or 52.2% last year. The current year rate was negatively impacted by higher inbound and outbound grade expense, partially offset by price increases. Consolidated SG&A expense totaled $59.6 million, or 60.5%, for the current quarter, compared to $60.1 million, or 55.1% last year. The first quarter consolidated operating loss totaled $6.9 million, or 7% of net revenues, compared to $1.2 million, or 1.1% of net revenues in the prior year. Now, let's turn to the balance sheet. Cash, cash equivalents, and investments as of April 30th, 2022, totaled 64 million compared to 52.7 million at the end of last year's first quarter. We had no borrowings on our 75 million ABL credit facility at quarter end. We remain in a strong cash position with a debt-free balance sheet. We will continue to take a conservative approach to cash through disciplined expense management, particularly in the volatile and and challenging environment. Total quarter end inventory was 161.8 million compared to $150.3 million at the end of the first quarter last year. During the quarter, we repurchased approximately $10.5 million of our common stock, representing 1.4 million shares and an average price of $7.35. $35.3 million remains available under the $15 million repurchase authorization. Now, let's shift to our, let's shift to our fiscal 2023 outlook. 
as we expect the challenging macroeconomic environment to continue for the balance of the year and that it will take time to return the peer to e-commerce business to growth, we have lowered our outlook for the fiscal year. All forward-looking guidance numbers that I will discuss are non-GAAP. For fiscal 2023, we expect consolidated net revenues of 490 to 505 million compared to 540.5 million in fiscal 2022. We expect our consolidated gross margin will range from 54.5% to 55% compared to 53.3% last year. The potential year-over-year -year increase is primarily related to price increases, partially offset by incremental freight expense. Consolidated SG&A expense should range from 248 to 253 million compared to 258.8 million in fiscal 2022. The reduction in SG&A expense is being driven by cost reduction initiatives and reduction in compensation expense, marketing, and other variable related expenses due to the expected sales decline from last year. We expect consolidated diluted EPS of 35 to 50 cents compared to 57 cents last year. Net capital spending should total approximately 10 to 12 million compared to 5.5 million in the prior year. Operator, we will now open up the call to questions. Thank you. If you would like to signal with questions, please press star 1 on your touchtone telephone. If you're joining us today using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Again, that will be star 1 if you would like to signal with questions. Our first question will come from Oliver Chen with Cowan. Hi, Tom Nash on for Oliver Chen. Uh, a couple questions on consumer health. Uh, with regard to price increases, could you provide some additional color on where these are occurring um, across both channel and category? And uh, are there some areas of the business that are taking prices better than others? Yeah, in terms of prices, talk about it maybe first by brand. Um, at Pura Vita, that they've had price increases across um, nearly all of the product categories, and it seems to be a good level of accept acceptance from the consumer. Um, at Vera Bradley, we've been um, more targeted in those price increases, really looking at it by item because of the diversity of our assortment there. Um, and what we're seeing, though, is that as we've increased price increases, that the consumers are accepting it, but not with an unlimited acceptance. So we're having to be very disciplined and very targeted, and we'll continue to evaluate that and continue to look at prices as we move forward. Uh, but I would say overall the reaction, um, it's not necessarily been different by channel, but what we have seen, is, as we talked about earlier, is just more acceptance, more spending overall by the higher income customer and obviously a pullback from the lower income customer. But what's been interesting is even looking at promotional activity, we found that the promotional activity is really not necessary for the high income customer that they seem to be accepting um, their price increases. Okay, great. Um, and a follow-up on supply chain disruptions. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on inventory management through the summer. And additionally, if we reach peak inflation here, um, how does the overall business view promotional possibilities across um, categories and channel? Yeah, I can take the, uh, that question. Uh, in regards to uh, supply chain, you know, we continue to see kind of some disruptions in the supply chain. We're not back to pre-pandemic levels on, uh, on time delivery even with extending our expectation of when that, that product should be delivered. All that being said, we, we are in a good inventory, better inventory, let me say better inventory position than we were throughout the uh, uh, year last year, and we expect to be in a better inventory position during the summertime. And, you know, given our sales reduction, we will be looking at potentially cutting forward purchases uh, given where our current inventory level is. In regards to promotionality, as we think about the uh, later in the year, as with our kind of our gross margin guidance, we expect promotionality not to change based on our original expectation, but we'll continue to assess that throughout the summer and throughout the rest of this year. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, and one final question on Pure Vita. Um, can you provide some additional detail regarding the strategies um, for the marketing platform enhancements and any synergies that might be available um, from the Vera Bradley platform. 
Yeah, great question. You know, first of all, bringing Lockheed in was a critical step. If, if you've been following our story, a few years ago, we brought Darren Hull in, who kind of rebuilt the marketing platform at Vera Bradley, brought in data analytics, and really kind of moved us forward. Um, what we're doing is with Pure Vita is basically going down a similar path by bringing Lockheed in that the Pure Vita team had done an extraordinary job of really leveraging the social media platforms for, you know, customer acquisition over the years. We're really best of class. But as this whole, as the whole channel and the world change, that's become obviously much less effective. Um, and so now what we're doing is really building out our data platform, building out our first party marketing, but then also um, starting to expand in stores and use, using stores as another avenue for acquisition will be really critical. And then the other thing is, as we're thinking about the marketing for Pure Vita, it's not just the data, but it's also looking at different channels, both from a performance marketing and also leveraging even heavier the influencer um, part of the business. Because what we're seeing in a lot of the direct-to-consumer companies with lower AOVs is the importance of kind of re-leveraging out the influencer, putting more uh, in, more time and energy into the influencer uh, tribe, so to speak, and that that is well underway with with Griff really leading that initiative. Thanks for your question, Tom. Thank you. And our next question will come from Eric Better with SCC Research. Good morning. Good morning, Eric. Good morning. Good morning. Could you talk a little bit um, about the collaborations? Uh, quite obviously, we've been very, you've been a little more expansive with them, and also it's been a little, you know, we've innovative in terms of things like the recent Tupperware collaboration. You know, how do you? Where is, um, I guess, kind of the limit on how far you want to take the collaborations going forward for both Pure Vita and for Vera Bradley? You know, one, our collaboration partnerships that we're doing is really about, you know, customer acquisition, reaching out to new customers, expanding the tribe of customers inside Vera Bradley um, and Pure Vita. And over the last couple of years, we've really had a lot of success in doing that through, you know, our Disney partnerships, our Harry Potter partnerships, and most recently through the Star Wars partnership that we find it really brings a new excitement, a new customer who discovers our brands, which we think is great. I think you're right that as we think about the Coleman opportunity, right, moving into some of this outdoor space, being in Target, you know, it's, it's great to see the brand at kind of the end cap in Target. It gets a lot of new customers to see it, um, as well as thinking about things like Tupperware, that it's a way to, to get new customers in the brand, people that might not be thinking about us from a bag business, but love the pattern, love the brand, and a new way to join. So we, we think we have to continue to balance that, continue to look for new, unique partnerships to keep it fresh and keep it exciting. Um, and I would say that probably the level of collaborations we've been doing is probably around where we would want to be. I don't think that we'll continue to do more and more. I think the trick is continue to find more and more powerful ones. But we've been very excited with the ones we've launched in both brands so far and have had very good customer responses. Okay. Um, when we look at, um, and you mentioned a little bit, the back to campus season, obviously that's a big season for you. And last year um, there were some opportunities that because of supply chain and kind of the flows didn't um, materialize greatly as you would like. You know, how focused and what should we be thinking about you guys doing in terms of that season going forward? Because, like, incredibly enough, I'm sure that's going to start in about two to three weeks. Yeah. No, I think the back to – you know, we're, we're definitely very hopeful on the back-to-campus season coming up. If you think about last year, there still was a lot of noise, shall we say, around COVID, people going back to school, all the stuff that was happening out in the media. So – between having some supply chain disruptions, having a maybe a lack of singular focus with kids getting back to school, we think there's some opportunity as we move into this year. Our inventories are in much better position than they were last year, and we're anticipating that the customer will have more open to spend overall as they go back to school. Um, so we, we are hopeful. We feel like we're set up and ready to go. Um, and then we'll start, you know, what we're doing this year, too, is really leveraging out at Vera Bradley kind of the 
the streaming TV. We think it's a way to bring new new uh, customers into our back to campus business. Great. And last question. Uh, in terms of the store mix, you're now more outlets in the Vera Brandon side. You're more outlet stores than full price stores. You know, what should we think, be thinking about that mix and kind of where is the store? And you obviously been shrinking the full price store base. Where is the kind of correct mix of product and amount of stores that should be out there for Vera Bradley? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, in terms of store mix, I think two things is we think about our full line uh, business. What we think about is the omni-channel approach, right, between our e-commerce business and our full line stores. We think it's important that we have a mix of both. We think the brick and mortar plays an important role in that mix and will continue to. Um, and I think you will see us continue to look at different ways of innovating within our full line uh, portfolio and continuing to look at opportunities. Um, particularly, I think, you know, going forward as we look at new real estate uh, formats, opportunities, where customers are, I think you'll continue to see experimentation there. Uh, at the same time, we do believe that the factory channel um, is an important channel for us. Um, obviously, right now with gas prices, there's a cyclical pressure on that channel, but long term, it's been a very good channel for us, both from an acquisition and a volume and profitability standpoint. Um, so we expect um, that we'll continue with, you know, the focus on the factory channel to kind of balance our full price e-commerce slash brick and mortar strategy. Great. Thank you. Good luck for the rest of the year. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. And our next question will come from Joe Gomez with Noble Capital. Good morning, and thanks for taking my questions. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Jeff. The, the, the first question you mentioned, um, you know, the, the uh, household income under 55, we're seeing some difficulty there. Um, any data on, you know, what percentage of your overall customers that uh, group makes up and, you know, how has that been shifting uh, over time? Yeah, a couple things. One, it's about 20% of our customer spend is coming out of that customer group. Um, it, you know, over the last kind of two years, we've been focusing on really bringing in the 25 to 35 year old customer um, as we've continued to, you know, bring new customers into the Vera Bradley brand. And when we started bringing in that younger customer, the average household income was lower in that group than, you know, in our traditional customer base. So we've seen that group grow slightly, but it's really due to the age. So we think that acquiring that customer in that age category is really important to the long-term health of the brand. You know, the cyclical pressure we're experiencing um, obviously is painful to go through, but, you know, again, we do believe it's a cyclical one that will change and having that uh, population and our database and attracted to our brand, we think will make the brand stronger over the long term. Okay, thanks for that. And then you mentioned about the, the, the cost reduction initiatives. Um, I think you said you hope to identify them uh, here by the end of this quarter. Maybe a little more color on, you know, when you think those um, reductions will be implemented and when do you think you'll you'll start to see um, you know, the, the 15 to 25 million of cost savings come through? That's a great question. And, you know, first of all, we already have begun to take some of the costs out. But what we're really doing is a top to bottom scrub to figure out with the economy potentially being in this lower household income customer really already in a recession. And if that continues for a while, we feel that bringing down the overall cost structure, more what I'll call the structural cost structure is important. So we're, we've been involved already. We're in the midst of doing all of that work to look at both the short-term actions that we'll begin to take even now as we're identifying them, as well as more of the long-term, what I'll call process improvement ones that might take a little bit of time, you know, kind of months to implement. Um, it might take a little bit longer, but, but we'll begin to continue to push those cost reductions even now. Um, and we'll have a lot more clarity on the next call um, but we wanted to make sure um, everybody knew that the work was underway. 
Yeah, I think to Rob's point, last point there, we'll, we'll be able to give a little bit more color uh, on the second quarter call. But the range of 15 to 25, if you want to think about it, that is an annualized number, as you can think about for next year, that ultimately our structure would be about 15 to $25 million less in SG&A. That would be the intent. And we will work through some of that. We'll get some of that benefit call in the second, third, and fourth quarter this year, but we will not get all of that benefit this year. And then we have other um, SG&A acts underway and variable cost actions underway as we speak. So, And we've embedded what we believe we'll get in – benefit this year in their uh, SGNA guidance of 248 to 253. Okay. Thank you for that. And, and one last one for me, if, if I may. Um, you know, one of the things that we've talked about in the past is, you know, the potential of doing, you know, another t pure Vita type of acquisition. Given the challenges in the market today, um, you know, it would seem to be a potentially opportunistic time to make such a type of acquisition just trying to get a feel for you know what your guys thoughts are uh, given today on the acquisition pipeline um, I think it's a great question and you're right there's always this balance between the macro environment being more challenging and that can put some pressure on valuations downward which can be opportunistic and so we are watching that but at the same time, we do believe that focusing on getting the expenses out, you know, really working on the two core businesses, really getting those strong in the, the short term is our number one focus, but we continue to keep our eyes open um, in the M&A market. So, but right now our head's really kind of head down, let's focus on these two brands, let's get the cost structure right, um, and make sure that we really do the best the best we can as we move through this short-term recessionary environment. Great. Thanks for taking the questions. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Our next question will come from Steve Marotta with CL King and Associates. Good morning, Rob and John. Can you talk a little bit about the costing increases that you're feeling, the offsetting price increases? and how that may play out in gross margin in the second, third, and fourth quarter? Yeah, so the second quarter is going to continue to be under pressure from the inbound and outbound freight expense that we're seeing. We're not lapping some of the high points of last year. That will be, we'll be lapping that next year. So second quarter will definitely have more pressure in it, uh, similar to the pressure you saw in the first quarter. And as we think about the back half of the year, we should be lapping some of the higher freight expense and hopefully seeing some benefit uh, with, you know, uh, inbound and outbound freight expense if we see some change in the macroeconomic environment. But all that being said, we're also seeing some uh, incremental expense associated with fuel surcharges that's hitting kind of our uh, P&L. I'd expect it to be hitting a lot of P&Ls right now. So that's also going to be a headwind as we kind of manage our way through the rest of this year. If you think about from a cost increase, your, your question in regards to kind of input cost increase, that will be mostly in, in regards to next year. We'll see some, you know, the cotton price increases will flow into next year, and we're, we're trying to get ahead of that with some price increases, so, you know, this year that ultimately will help benefit next year. That's helpful. And besides travel and the back-to-campus, Rob, that you had already mentioned, are there other categories that – you're relatively optimistic about in the second half, and if so, why? Yeah, I think the other thing that we've been doing is is building out what we've called our winning intersections in terms of things like our home category, and we're seeing nice growth there. We have, you know, the important launches coming up, like our cloud footwear launch that will be coming up. Um, so we feel really good about what's in the pipeline, a lot of innovation coming forward, a lot of reason for excitement. You know, the the, the real balance is how to continue to expand the brand and then manage through the cyclical, you know, short-term recessionary pressure. But we, we have a lot of great innovation in the pipeline that will make the brand even stronger as we move forward. Understood. Thank you. I'll take the balance offline. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. And that does conclude the question and answer session. I'll now turn the conference back over to Rob Wallstrom for closing remarks. Before I close, I would like to thank John Keyes, who has served with this distinction on the Vera Bradley Inc. board since 2010. And he has held the important roles of lead independent director and chair of the audit committee. 
John retired from the board in conjunction with this year's annual shareholders meeting last month. And on behalf of the other directors and the entire company, I would like to express my gratitude to him for his service and invaluable counsel over the last 12 years. Fran Phillip has been named lead independent director. She has tremendous institutional knowledge, serving on our board since 2011, and a wealth of industry experience, having served as chief merchandising officer of L.L. Bean and holding a variety of roles with other retailers, including William Sonoma and The Gap. Fran is currently on the boards of publicly traded Coates Group and Vista Outdoor. Christina Cashman, on our board for two years, has stepped into the role of audit chair. A CPA with a strong financial and accounting background, she has served as the CFO for several companies and currently is the audit committee chair for publicly held Bassett Furniture Industries. In closing, we are preparing for the macro environment to remain challenging through the remainder of this year and into next year. And despite the strength in Pura Vida's store business and opportunity for new store growth, we know that it will take time to return the e-commerce business to growth as rebuilding the marketing platform and remixing the marketing program is underway. We are taking decisive actions that will further strengthen both core brands and our enterprise as a whole, not only to successfully manage through this period, but position us for the future. Our teams are focused and our cash position and balance sheet remain strong. We have managed through difficult periods before and we will again. We look forward to returning both brands to steady growth. We will keep you posted on our progress. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to speaking with you on the August 31st on our second quarter earnings call. Thank you. And that does conclude today's conference. We do thank you for your participation. Have an excellent day.